Well, good morning, folks. I hope everybody is doing well and is uh, recu recuperated from the winter storm of last week. I know we still have some folks in our state that are 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 struggling, and I hope we'll keep them in our prayers. Uh, we'll be starting the, the meeting momentarily, and uh, so uh, bear with us as we get everybody into this new environment that we, it's not new anymore, it's been a year, but, but uh, we'll, we'll be ready to go just shortly. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good is, morning. Uh, 11 o'clock, sir, and the, the gavel is yours. All right. All right. I now call the uh, to order today's meeting of the Board of Supervisors for the University of Louisiana System. Before we begin, Carol, will you please call the roll? Ms. Ms. Bailey? Here. Mr. Busada? Here. Mr. Carter? Present. Dr. Clark? Here. Dr. Condos? Here. Mr. Davison? Here. Ms. Donahoe? Present. Mr. Kitchen? Here. Ms. Methvin? Here. Mr. Perkins? Ms. Pierre? Present. Mr. Robinson? Ms. Mr. Romero? Here. Ms. Russell? Here. Mr. Salter? Here. Mr. Stevens? Here. We have a quorum. All right, great. In order to proceed with today's meeting, I need a motion and a second to accept the certificate of inability to operate in order so to- many. Second, Virgil Robinson. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. I would like to advise you that the, um, the content I'm sorry. Prior to that, let's uh, Carol. Uh, we need to we need a roll call for the for the the the, the motion in a second. Miss Bailey. Yes. Mr. Posada. Yes. Mr. Carter. Yes. Dr. Clark. Yes. Dr. Condos. Yes. Mr. Davison. Yes. Miss Donahoe. Yes. Mr. Kitchen. Yes. Miss Methvin. Yes. Mr. Perkins. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. And Mr. Stevens? Yes. It's unanimous. It's approved. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to advise you that the, the content of today's meeting, including chat, is being recorded and subject to public records requests. So please keep that in mind as we conduct our business. To members of the public who are, who are viewing this via YouTube, be reminded that anyone who wishes to make a public comment on a particular agenda item, <clears throat> on a particular agenda item can email public, uh, public comment at ulsystem.edu. Uh, 
edu. And along with your comment, please include your full name, affiliation, as well as the agenda item number upon which you are commenting. We'll now have the invocation by Mr. Salter. I'm gonna be sure I'm on unmute. Y'all are welcome to hear my prayer, but, and I know that the good Lord's gonna hear it, but I want you to hear it as well, perhaps. And we pray. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here today. I thank you, Lord, for each member of the board and their willingness to serve. Lord, we continue uh, to face many challenges and opportunities. And Lord, uh, this applies, of course, to all of us as well as the students that we serve. Lord, in particular, I would uh, give thanks for the hope that the vaccine gives us. And Lord, I would uh, ask that you would continue to guide those in places of responsibility, particularly uh, as we uh, try to address the uh, pandemic. Lord, I thank you as well for the members of our staff, for our president and others, and for the work that they do. And I thank you as well, Lord, for those who work at the, uh, at the uh, system level, at the university level. I ask that you'd bless our presidents and others that work with them. And that you'd bless our students as well, Lord, because they've faced difficulties like the, all the rest of us have during these uh, uh, difficult times. I thank you, Lord, for the uh, many ways that you've blessed us and ask that you'd guide and direct us as a board so that the decisions that we make here today will be in the best interest of our students and the citizens of our state. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. Thank you. Now we'll have the approval of the minutes of the January 7th, 2021 board meeting. Now, please have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the last meeting and the same motion to include the request to dispense with committee deliberations and meet as a committee of the whole. Roll call, please vote. Uh, my name is Robert Dawson. We need a motion, Mr. Carter. So, so a motion. Right. Anybody second? Second. All right, we've had a second. Thank you. Uh, a, roll, um, a motion and a second. Roll okay. call vote, please. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Busada? Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Mr. Davison? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Ms. Rem Mr. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. Every member can vote on all items and as has been our practice, the chairs of the committees will conduct the business of each particular committee. Are there any questions? If there are not any questions, we'll first have the academic and student affairs uh, report by Dr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today we have eight items on the Academic and Student Affairs Committee agenda. Seven are action items that require approval and the eighth item includes faculty and student presentations, which are informational only. Um, each member previously received executive summaries and associated materials on the action items. Uh, Dr. Janine Kahn, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs is gonna provide the report, Dr. Kahn. Thank you, Supervisor Clark, and good morning to you, Chair Carter, members of the board, and President Henderson, as well as those participating via Zoom or watching on YouTube. At this time, I will present the seven academic items that require action by the board today. Agenda items F1 through F5 pertain to Grambling State University. Today, all requests being considered establish partnerships with various organizations that will assist Grambling in expanding its academic reach. F1 is a request to enter into an articulation agreement with Life University, a private university located in Georgia, which focuses on health sciences. The proposed agreement establishes a pathway for Grambling students to complete the pre-chiropractic coursework, 90 credit hours in total, at the university with transition to the Doctor of Chiropractic program offered by Life University. Grambling will confer the Bachelor of Science in Biology to those students who satisfactorily complete the pre uh, chiropractic program at Grambling and 30 hours of the DCP at Life University. F2 is a request for Grambling to enter into an alliance agreement with the Arizona Board of Regents 
for and on behalf of Arizona State University. The proposed agreement will allow eligible Grambling students to enroll in a specific set of upper level courses offered by ASU. The purpose of this joint endeavor is to expand course offerings available to Grambling students who have an interest in the area of real estate. F3 is a request for approval of an MOU with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration of the U.S. Department of Com uh, Commerce. The proposed partnership will assist GSU in addressing one of the main digital divide issues, the lack of broadband connectivity in the region serviced by the university. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Connie Walton, who serves as provost for Grambling State University, to provide you with an overview of this very, very promising endeavor. Dr. Walton. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, very good. So I wanna take a few minutes to highlight some of the components of this agreement. Next slide, please. We will specifically be a part of the Minority Broadband Initiatives College Partnership Technical Assistance Program. This program is open to HBCUs and other minority institutions. If we are approved to enter into this agreement, we would be the first HBCU in the state of Louisiana that's a part of this program. This program primarily has a focus of expanding broadband broadband access to rural communities and underserved communities. Next slide, please. So we all know that broadband is critical to economic development in, in attracting businesses and creating jobs. Next slide. Broadband is also important to citizens, all citizens, including citizens in rural and underserved communities, being able to reap the benefits of telemedicine and being fully engaged in educational programs that are delivered in the virtual environment. Next slide, please. So one particular component of this agreement is NTIA would offer a training course to Grambling State University's faculty and students. The training course would focus on broadband planning, stakeholder outreach, and digital inclusion. Once the faculty and students are trained, they would then go into communities and train stakeholders in the communities. Next slide, please. So, there are benefits that NTIA would realize as a result of this agreement, as well as benefits to Grambling State University. One of the benefits for Grambling State University is that faculty and students will, will be able to continue to engage in community service projects that have a overall objective of making the lives of citizens better. We will have an interdisciplinary team, sorry, that will be working to address economic, health, education issues that are impacted by a lack of access to quality broadband service. The faculty and students who are part of this program will develop a, acquire a set of unique skills that will support them being more competitive. Next slide, please. So when you look at the NTIA GSU agreement, you will see that it's in alignment with the governor's broadband for everyone in Louisiana. This particular plan for the state of Louisiana has a goal that by 2029, all Louisianians will have access to high quality broadband service. Next slide, please. When you look at the action steps that have been identified for the Bell Commission, these action steps, Grambling State University will be able to contribute to achieving some of these things by through this partnership. Specifically, if you look at the commission wants to engage with agencies that include educational institutions that will assist in identifying barriers to adoption by individuals and families in Louisiana. The commission also wants to have an inventory of best practices that will turn Louisiana households into broadband households. So Grambling State University will be positioned to be able to assist in these areas. 
when you look at the desire to utilize federal mapping and data resources as a part of the training, our faculty and students will be trained on these resources. Next slide, please. So what's the current status of broadband access in Louisiana? Next slide. Looking at data that was captured February the 2nd this year, Louisiana is ranked 33rd in broadband access. Looking at the data closer, you will see that high-speed internet coverage is primarily centered in Southeast Louisiana. Next slide, please. When you look at some of the parishes, you will see that there are citizens where, that have no access to broadband services. Next slide, please. So I indicated that one component of the agreement is training. We have identified a target date for mid-March to engage in this training. Next slide. Faculty and students will be involved in the training. It's virtual training over a two day period. And this is an example of some of the topics that will be covered during the training. Next slide, please. So I indicated earlier that an interdisciplinary faculty and student team will be involved in this particular agreement. So right now we have all of the departments in the College of Business who are scheduled to be a part of this agreement. In the College of Arts and Sciences, we have chemistry, computer science, engineering technology, the Honors College is on board, the Office of Service Learning and the library. Next slide, please. So we expect that if we are allowed to enter into this partnership, that there will be other benefits that we will reap, including the ability to attain additional funding and other research projects that will be spinoffs. So even in this preliminary phase of talking with NTIA about this agreement, we have been connected with other universities such as Emory University. So Emory University shared with us that a graduate student was engaging in a research project that allowed him to look at COVID-19 impacting communities and then match it to broadband capabilities. So we have a senior chemistry major, Mr. Dale Major, who is now engaged in this project for the state of Louisiana. And he's having constant communication with that Emory graduate student. So I've been able to highlight just a few of the benefits of entering into this agreement. And so we're asking that you approve us to enter into this agreement. Thank you. Thank you for the succinct and, and exciting overview of this uh, proposed partnership. Before we move forward, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Walton at this time or any comments? I, I have, uh, I yes, have a, I do. <laughs> go ahead, I defer. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for that presentation. Will this affect all parishes of Louisiana or only those impacted by grambling? We are primarily going to be focusing on the parishes that are in close proximity to Grambling. At one of the legislative sessions that we recently had, several of the legislators indicated to us that that was going to be a big priority of this new legislative session was to get uh, funds available for to increase the broadband uh, of, in all the rural parishes, particularly. Uh, will this impact your group as well, or do you have any idea? It, it will, because the intent is that we would not only partner with NTIA, but partner with other agencies that have a similar goal of, you know, expanding or enhancing the broadband access to those rural and underserved communities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Clark. Uh, my yeah, I'm unmuted here. Um, Dr. Walton, thank you as, as always for an excellent presentation. Uh, two questions. One, how did this become uh, you know, actualized to this point? Who initiated? Was it Grambling initiated to uh, NTIA or vice versa? It, I, okay. it was not Grambling. We actually were contacted by a person that used to work for the EPA and we were working on a project with this person at the EPA, it's a community project. So he reached out to me and he said, Dr. Walton, 
this is something I really think you all should be a part of. And so at the university, we looked at it. And once we looked at it, we thought it would be great for not only the university, but for the state of Louisiana. Excellent. Uh, appreciate the, the networking and the relationships that, that, that lead to these things. Second question, you, certainly you've uh, you know, identified significant number of benefits. Are there, is there a downside? Is, is there something that we should be aware of that, that is going to be inhibited or, or you know, create a difficulty for us? I don't, I, I can't think of a downside. I think it's a win-win for Gramlin State University, for our students, for our faculty, for the entire community. Thank you. Uh, Dr. And Dr. Clark, if I could uh, just uh, piggyback on that just a little bit. Uh, we, we are receiving uh, communications almost daily from uh, potential partners. And, and I have to say that whenever I get these and I forward them to, to Dr. Walton, I don't know how she ever sleeps <laughs> uh, because you know there, she always seems to, to make a quick turnaround on, on putting these proposals together. And so, you know, we, we, we partnered with uh, a group of ministers in the Monroe area post 2016 uh, floods. And so we, we're really uh, enjoying it in this season, the opportunity to, uh, to expand our outreach, uh, primarily to the Northeast uh, area. And of course, many of these areas uh, lack certain things that, that we take for granted. Uh, and broadband is certainly one of those. So we, we believe this will actually provide a roadmap uh, for uh, the work that the legislature is talking about doing. And we really expect to have the, uh, the, the, the footprint in place and, and what they are doing will, will absolutely complement uh, the, the path that, that uh, we, we will set forth in, uh, in this initiative. Yeah, I think, I think this is an extraordinary, extraordinary initiative. Um, one of the things that we've been focused on from the board and Dr. Henderson will tell you this, is that the concern about having equity relative to environments that individuals uh, uh, attain their, their higher educational uh, training. I give the extreme example of my son doing distant learning right now from New Orleans. Um, he's in a school in California and he, uh, we had a hurricane occurring down here while the folks in the other part of the, the country didn't, wasn't experiencing a hurricane. He had a, he had a test to take at that time. I know that's sort of an extreme example, but we certainly want to have equitable situations for individuals in rural areas, et cetera, to make sure we, we level the playing field for uh, the ability to have um, uh, folks to, to reach their full potential. So I think this is a wonderful um, initiative that certainly we would like to see um, broader, um, as broad as possible throughout the state. Any other questions for Dr. Walton? Well, Dr. Walton, President Gallo, once again, Grambling is stepping up to the, the plate, not only to uh, encourage students participating and educating um, along this process and with the faculty, to, but to support the community that you serve. And so thank you very much for your leadership um, on this as always. And this Moving does help us recruit too, Dr. Khan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it certainly will. There are so many benefits to this that uh, we can't even think of today, I would imagine. Moving along with the agenda, we do have two more items from Grambling State University. F4 is a request for approval of a business pathway agreement with North Shore Technical Community College. The proposed agreement establishes a very clear route for North Shore students to transfer to Grambling in order to pursue a baccalaureate degree in accounting, computer information systems, management, or marketing. And the last item from Grambling, F5, is a request to enter into an MOU with Marywood University, a small Catholic liberal arts university located in Pennsylvania. The purpose of this proposed MOU is to establish a collaborative partnership between the two universities in regards to research projects, lectures and symposiums, exchange of students and faculty, and other mutually beneficial endeavors. Another aspect of the proposed MOU establishes that preferential review of Grambling applicants to Mary Wood's PhD in clinical psychology will occur for those GS students that participated in collaborative work between the two universities. The last two items, F6 and F7, are requests from Nichols State University. F6 is a request to offer two new undergraduate certificates, one in professional writing and the other in public history. In order to inform our new board members and to refresh the memories of those that have been on the board for some time, I'll provide a quick overview of what an undergraduate certificate is. 
In February 2019, the Board of Regents approved the action or the addition of a new upper level undergraduate certificate. Such an offering has basically become a national expectation. An undergraduate certificate is a very focused incremental credential. The UC can be linked to an existing degree program major as an additional focus area, or it can be a standalone area of specialization to augment a student's educational background or to meet industry demand for upper level, upper level training. This type of certificate, which is to be comprised of at least 18 credit hours, of which most have to be at the upper junior senior level, is something that is relatively new to the state, as I mentioned. Such an offering is typically of interest to existing students that want to focus on an area outside of or which complements their major, as well as those in the workforce that want to return to a university to tweak their skill sets. Since 2019, 23 undergraduate certificates have been established by public universities here in Louisiana, with the majority of those being offered by UL system member institutions. Nickel proposes the UC in public writing, which will require the completion of nine courses and will provide study and training in writing and editing, preparing students for careers that demand such skills. And the UC in public history offers 21 hours of concentrated study, training, and hands-on experience that will allow students to develop skills necessary for employment in a diverse range of public history positions. And the last item, F7, is a request to split the existing Bachelor of Science and Petroleum Services into two separate degree programs, a Bachelor of Science in Safety Management and a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering Technology. The university has offered the um, Bachelor of, of Science in Petroleum Engineering for over 40 years and would like to reconfigure, it, reconfigure the current degree which has two concentrations, safety technology and exploration and pr production into two standalone degree programs in order to better recognize the skill sets gained in each area of focus. This change will come at no cost to the university and they would like to move forward with the splitting of the degree. In attendance today from Nichols, we have Dr. Jared Wells, professor of history and Dr. Robert Alexander, department head of English to answer questions that you may have regarding the proposed undergraduate certificates and Dr. Milton Sadu, Department Head of Petroleum Engineering Technology and Safety Management, as well as Dr. John Doucette, Dean of Arts and Sciences and Technology, to respond to questions about the proposed reconfiguration of the BSPS. Dr. Clark, that concludes my presentation of the seven action items you're to consider today. Thank you very much, Dr. Kahn. Um, I want to express my appreciation to, to the faculty at Nichols who are present. Uh, if there are questions, I'm not sure if anyone on the board has questions with either of those proposals. I want to make a comment that I, I sincerely appreciate Nichols' uh, effort to create an, you know, further undergraduate certificates. As Dr. Khan mentioned, this certainly is a, an area that is gaining momentum nationwide. And I think that uh, students who are able to receive these in addition to their baccalaureate or advanced degrees, certainly are gonna benefit in the, in, the, in the workforce of the future. So uh, accommodations to you Nichols faculty for, for doing that. Um, if no one requires any further clarification then, I'd like to go ahead and recommend uh, approval of items F1 to F7 at this time. Uh, can I have a motion and a second? So uh, moved. <laughs> uh, Supervisor Donahue, I, I believe you, yep, raised your hand. So we've got a motion there. A second, please. I'll second. All right. Uh, Mimi Methan, uh, Supervisor Methan, we have a second. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments from the board at this time? Any comments from the public? <laughs> All right, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and, and ask for a vote. All in favor of accepting and approving items F1 to F7, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Hearing none, uh, the motion is approved. Um, one other uh, uh, set of information we wanna go ahead and, and present at this time, the University of Louisiana System uh, is fortunate to have extremely talented and, and uh, faculty supporting our, our nine member institutions, as well as we know, extremely bright and innovative students. Um, so that we can hear firsthand of the teaching, research and service uh, being conducted by faculty and to learn about 
the, the students our universities are educating. Uh, Chair Carter uh, thought it a good idea to spotlight a faculty member and a student at each board meeting. And personally, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, a great idea and, and look forward to this uh, becoming a, a part of not only this uh, activity today, but in, in future board meetings. Um, so at this time, I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, Ms. Erica Kale, the Vice President uh, for Student Affairs to introduce our two guests today. Thank you, Dr. Clark. As we know, there are various roles on a college campus, and I will venture to say that none is as important as the role of a faculty member and the role of a student, particularly during these challenging times. Today, we would like to recognize a faculty member and student for exemplary work that they are doing. I would like to first invite Dr. Ramesh Kalaru, faculty member of Yale Lafayette, to talk about some of the work that he has been doing. Dr. Kalaru. He's not, uh, not on I screen. Think and, no. I thought he was on. I, I saw him a few minutes ago. Here. There, there he is. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Carter. Uh, thank you, President Henderson, for this extraordinary honor and opportunity. And thank you uh, to all the board members. I've had the honor of coming to you on occasion as Vice President for Research at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette to talk about the growth of our research at UL Lafayette, to seek blessing and your permission for various strategic initiatives uh, to grow our impact as a university. and more often than not, to report on dollars and cents uh, of the growth of our research program. And while I was proud of all of those, I have never been more proud than I am today as I introduced two of our faculty, two of our research superstars, people who make this magic at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette happen. Uh, we talk at UL Lafayette about research for a reason. And for, as far as I'm concerned, there is no better reason or a greater cause for celebration than what you will hear from these two fine individuals. So with that, I'll invite Dr. Francois Willinger, uh, the director of our New Iberia Research Center and a faculty member in our Department of Biology, and Ms. Jane Fontenot, associate director who leads our industry-funded research to talk about the role that the mm -hmm. university has had in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine with Pfizer-BioNTech. So Francois and Jane, if you can take it away. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I can put the video on, though, but maybe I, I can share the, the screen. Well, first of all, uh, welcome and thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Chairman L.A. and President. Uh, let me try and share that. If can. And I will need some help to... Got it. Sorry. Can you, let me just put that. Uh, can you see the full screen or do you see the, uh, all right. Yes. <clears throat> so again, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Jane Fontenot, my uh, co-director and the head of the contract research at the uh, New Iberia Research Center. And so the mission of the center, which is located about 20 miles south of uh, Lafayette, New Iberia, is really to bring to the clinic uh, new therapies, new vaccines, uh, or starting sometimes from basic science all the way to, uh, as I said, the, as a preclinical model before the clinical um, trials, as you can uh, imagine. All right. See if I can get to the next. Okay, so we're a center of the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and uh, the uh, source of funding was fully self-funded, and most of the funding, about three quarters of the funding, still comes from the industry at this point. Also, the the little uh, blue uh, pie chart uh, shows that the federal uh, source of funding is uh, on the increase and certainly will be for the next uh, fiscal year. And then we also have some <clears throat> works that's funded by uh, nonprofits like uh, the Gates Foundation, among others. 
So we're the largest private center in the US. We have over some 8,600 uh, non-human primates here on site. Uh, and what's somewhat unusual, the uh, center operates also as a small business and the umbrella of the university. Um, <clears throat> among that, uh, the annual research revenue was somewhere between uh, 52 and 54 million during the last fiscal year. And uh, we'll probably surpass that easily next year. And all these are from out of state, sorry about that. So the particularity of uh, the center, we're really very, very well connected. Uh, we're connected to uh, most of the university you can see here, and it's not an exhaustive list, but we certainly work with uh, MIT, Harvard, John Hopkins, mm -hmm. even the Institute of Pasteur in Paris, uh, and so on and so forth. So we, we're certainly uh, well positioned, uh, both nationally and internationally. And so I will now step aside and let Jane talk about the uh, work that's been done for the COVID vaccines, uh, largely in uh, collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. Um, I have to tell you, I've been at Navier Research Center 23 years, and this is, this is the best reason that we do what we do. This success story is one that has came full cycle to us. Uh, we started working with Pfizer as early as last March on the possibility of developing a COVID vaccine. We had the infrastructure in place, thanks to our IACUC, thanks to the university, to be able to allow us to move very quickly. We had on-site non-human primates that we could start doing the vaccination portion of the study, while we actually assisted Pfizer in evaluating external facilities to do the challenge work. It took us a bit to identify those facilities. Um, I will tell you that while we're celebrating the fact that we started in March, and as of yesterday, New Iberia Research Center's employees received the Pfizer vaccine, which was such a rewarding and humble experience for all of us. Um, if we had had actually capabilities of doing biosafety level three work to handle the virus ourselves, we could have even had a, a more influential role in handling this pandemic. So the way that we had to do this work, um, we started the vaccine portion of it. We had to make arrangements to transfer the non-human primates to another facility. So we worked hand in hand with transporters. Um, it was, it's all been based on prior contacts, prior relationships, prior partnerships. We were definitely in the position to handle this well and to be such a key role and using all of our resources. Like I said, it's been extremely humbling. So while we, can say openly that we were involved in the Pfizer project. There were other projects as well, and we're still doing Pfizer research. We were very fortunate from the university's perspective that as the decision was being made at the university level for what were we gonna do with faculty, classes, sports, here at the research center, we were allowed to continue to do what we needed to do to be involved in this fight of this pandemic. We've evaluated eight to 10 vaccines. Not all of them made them to market. Some didn't make it to market fast enough. Once again, if we had had the BSL-3 capabilities here, we could have even more vaccines on the market. Um, we've also worked on doing animal model development. So part of this as well is, you know, which monkey is the best monkey to use for this type of studies? And having the extreme resources that we have, the multiple species on site, we were also instrumental in model development as well. It, it's been a, a tremendous journey for all of us. We've all had personal pieces of this. Um, we've had colleagues that we had to deal with being out for extended periods of time because they got sick themselves from COVID. And somehow we still managed to keep it all going. It, this is why we do what we do. It's such a great position to be in. All right. Thanks to Jane. I think Jane can uh, communicate the enthusiasm almost better than me for the, the, that type of research. So I just wanted to say, just uh, to double up, we still are working with a number of these uh, vaccines, uh, primarily to meet the, uh, the new looming uh, risk of mutants, like the South African mutants, etc. For example, the Gates-funded vaccine has a second uh, part that's ongoing with uh, Stanford, uh, Harvard, you name it. We, this is a very wide collaboration. 
<clears throat> the, I also said I, I'd share some of the uh, additional work we've been doing for um, meeting COVID, among others, the antibody therapy. And this is sort of uh, some of the cutting edge uh, technologies that we've developed here at, uh, at the New Iberia Research Center. So we have on site our own PET CT that was uh, obtained from NIH funds. <clears throat> and we can basically go from uh, one day using radioactive probes all the way to your uh, confocal uh, microscopy and basically get where the signal is in the animal, uh, sacrifice or collect biopsies, confirm that by different uh, imaging technologies, and then take the single cells and sort them with a flow by flow cytometry over the tissue and looking by microscopy to try to elucidate uh, mechanism. And I'll just share one slide with you, which is uh, fairly busy. These are four different monkeys that were given <clears throat> either a convalescent IgG, convalescent to COVID, uh, control, um, control IgG, human IgG, and then two monoclonal antibodies and neutralizing COVID antibodies. And we're able by labeling these with zirconium to follow the fate and distribution of these antibodies for uh, up to two weeks and beyond. And this is really, we're the only one, I think, at this point, able to do that in the, uh, in the country or in the world, which has been really uh, a, quite a, a fascinating journey. And with that, I'll conclude. Back to you, Ramesh. Thank you, Francois. And uh, thank you, Jane. I just want to leave all of you uh, with this humbling thought, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what is amazing to me, and I'm hopeful that we communicated that across to you, is that we are not just victims of COVID-19 or survivors of COVID-19. Here at the University of Louisiana, part of the University of Louisiana system, okay. Louisiana is leading the fight against COVID-19. And not only for this particular pandemic that we have, we are equipped and we are equipping ourselves even more so to fight pandemics of the future. And in this journey, I can tell you how honored I am to have support of President Sawa and uh, the president of the system, Dr. Henderson, and all of, all of you supervisors who enable the work that we do at the university and the magic that is created at the New Idea Research Center and several centers such as those happen. So with that, I turn it back to you. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share our enthusiasm and the work that we do here. Uh, back to you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalaru. And interesting work that you and your team are doing. We appreciate it. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be from Mr. Elliot Howell, a Grambling State University student and also an IBM Master's Fellow. Mr. Howell. Give me a second. All right, can everyone see me? Hi, everyone. My name is Elliot Howard. I'm a social scientist graduate student at Grambling State University with a focus on sociology with a deeper focus on critical race. As you all know, and as Ms. Kalei just said, I was the recipient of the IBM Master's Fellowship Award. Um, and that was mainly focused on the research I've been doing over part of my undergraduate career and my graduate career. Currently, I'm working on my master's thesis that is looking at the effects of um, colorblind racism in American uh, sitcom media over the past 30 years, starting with the 90s through the 2000s through to the 2010s. Um, I'm still continuing that research currently, and so far the results have been very fruitful showing some things. Uh, for example, I'll go ahead and give a little bit of a spoiler. The first show I actually wanted to look at was uh, the show Family Matters. And while the show shows that there is a deep focus on showing that there's this Black family living in Chicago, middle class, having a normal life, they're showing some of the issues that may be problematic shown in Eduardo Bonilla Silva's concept of uh, colorblind racism. One example was the character of Steve Urkel. Though he is a very intelligent young Black man going through school life and all these things, they don't show the effects of how he, him being Black may affect his school life, his normal life, and everything he goes through throughout his normal days. And it seems as if the show made him a little too outlandish, if any of you have seen the show. He is very accident prone, which is very comedic and very funny, but it is important that they are showing that there is a very intelligent young black man in this show. But there are, it seems as if they're a little bit fearful about showing more with the character because for example, with the, um, 
I believe it was a season four episode, the racial profiling episode where uh, Eddie Winslow has an interaction with the cops. Though they show a young black man having an interaction with the cops, they still show, they still afraid to show the systemic issues that black people may face within like dealing with police as we've seen within just even recent history with multiple people, even within the past, as we've seen three weeks having these issues. And it's strange to see that a show, once again, even with a black father cop, is still afraid to touch these issues when we have shown through research that these things keep happening to black people in these communities and of course other groups of color. But when you have these things happening and are afraid to talk about them, people do pick up on these things. And especially within sitcom media and even television media period within our news, within reality shows and all of these things, people can feel like that what they're watching gives them an idea of how the world should be working. This isn't always necessarily true, but many people can feel as if these are representing themselves. And one of the things we have to be concerned with is, are we giving someone a symbolic representation or a truly substantial res representation within this media? Now, understanding this and coming with this caveat, not every episode of these shows have to talk about the problem of race, especially with something like Family Matters. But when you do have these conversations about race, racism and systemic racism in America, it is important to come with it at it with a holistic, more substantial conversation that needs to be had there. And I actually do believe that is the thing for what I want to say right now. I am working through it with actually the Family Matters portion being the one I've had to do the most back research for because it's actually setting up the research for my future pieces. But I actually do believe that will be all of my time. Thank you so much for you guys for having me. I am honored, genuinely honored that you guys gave me the spotlight. This is genuinely incredible. And I've been a little nervous in this room because I see so many like people I just did not think I would ever be in a meeting with in any of my lifetimes. And it is very incredible to be in here with all of you. Thank you so much. Well, con congratulations, Mr. Howard, on your presentation and what you're doing and your achievement. It's just the type of thing we like to highlight and make sure that the world understands the great impact of the University of Louisiana system. And of course, the, the mighty Gramlin State and also relative to the professors who are dealing with cutting edge issues. Um, one of the most important issues of our time dealing with the COVID-19 virus and our role in helping to uh, present a solution. Um, this, this is world-class work. These are world-class presentations. And I am so excited just to hear and see and recognize the great works of such uh, profoundly um, talented and worthwhile individuals. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Ramesh and Mr. Howard. And just to uh, reiterate that Mr. Howard received an IBM Master's Fellowship. So that is quite an honor. And that is one of the reasons we invited him here today to talk a little bit about the work he did to receive that. Uh, Dr. Clark, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, first, uh, let, let me do a series of, of, of thanks and commendations. Chair Carter, let me extend it first to you. It was your idea to start to provide these highlights and I can't uh, think of a, a better start to this, this uh, concept. Um, certainly Francois, Jane and Ramesh, uh, extraordinary work, uh, cutting edge, makes us so proud uh, to, to be able to say that it's a UL system endeavor that is going forward. It actually makes me stop and think about all the decisions and resources that were uh, contemplated, provided in many years past by people who sat in our seats today that, that make that possible. So the decisions that we are gonna be looking at today certainly can impact the, the generations of the future. So that's something. And, and then for Mr. Howard, uh, just not only the, the depth and the, the relevancy of your current uh, uh, research enterprise, but the sincerity with which you delivered it and uh, your final remarks uh, certainly make me proud. Uh, to be able to impact students. So thank you both. Um, are there any other uh, businesses or questions to come before the Academic and Student Affairs Committee at this time? Hearing none, uh, we'll proceed then to the next item of business, which is athletics. Dr. Thank Condos. You, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, 
the uh, athletic committee, we have three items today on the uh, agenda. Mr. Bruce Janay will provide an overview of the consent uh, agenda items uh, by campus. Thank you so much, Dr. Condos, members of the board and Dr. Henderson. Item G1 is from Grambling, requesting approval of a revised complimentary athletic home game ticket policy, which is gonna be reduced to 25% per COVID-19 guidelines. The, can, the, the university will decrease the number of football, basketball, and baseball tickets. Item G2 is from Northwestern State, requesting approval of a contract with Mr. Ryan Hall, Assistant Athletic Director for Development, effective March 1st, 2021. These two agenda items have been reviewed by staff and are recommended for approval. Of course, if any member has a question or wishes to discuss these items, please let me know. Are there any questions or comments from uh, board members? Uh, any comments from the public? If no one requires further clarification of the agenda items, may I have a motion and a second for approval of items G1 to G2? So moved. Moved. A second. <clears throat> Ms. Ms. Donahoe and uh, Chairman Carter, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in, in favor say aye. 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 Any, aye. any opposed? <clears throat> The motion passes. <clears throat> Mr. Janay. Thank you. Uh, item G3, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, item G3 is from Southeastern, requesting approval of a contract with Mr. David Kiefer, head men's basketball coach, effective February 1st, 2021. This item has been reviewed by staff and is recommended for approval. Uh, are there any questions uh, from board members? Any comments, questions from the public? If no one requires further clarification, uh, may I have a motion to consider item G3 and let the record reflect Mr. Stevens has indicated his desire to abstain from discussion and consideration for this item. Motion approved. Mark, okay. I have a motion from uh, Mr. Romero. I'll second. Uh, Mr. Kitchens, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> the motion passes. If we have no other businesses at this time, uh, this will conclude the athletic committee. I need a motion to adjourn and a second, please. Yeah. I have to adjourn, right. Mr. Chairman, because it's in the committee as a whole. No need to adjourn. We can just go on to the next. Um, the next presentation will be facilities. facilities okay, thank planning. you, Chairman Carter. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, facilities planning, Mr. Kitchen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Condos. Okay, everybody can hear me. Uh, the yes. um, uh, There's been a proposed change on the agenda for the facilities planning committee. Uh, uh, item H9 um, has been removed from the agenda, and I need a motion and a second for approval to, to do that. I would like to make that motion, Mr. Kitchens. Okay. Lola, uh, Ms. Donahoe um, has moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. All right, Dr. Clark. So um, uh, any discussion on the motion and the second? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. We have 13 items on the facilities planning committee that are all consent agenda. Mr. Janae will provide an overview of the agenda items by campus. Bruce. Thank you so much, Ms. Mr. Kitchen and board members and Dr. Henderson. Item H1 is from Louisiana Tech, <coughs> requesting approval to name portions of various athletic facilities such as the Davison Athletic Complex, Football Press Box, Thomas Assembly Center, Women's Athletic Complex, and Baseball Complex to recognize the private support of the contributions and achievements of various individuals, families, and a private entity. 
Item H2, Nichols, approval to name the newly renovated space in Talbot Hall, the Dane Lede Gallery. This request is to recognize the longtime support and generosity that Dane and Lou Lede have contributed to the Department of Arts. Item H3 from Nichols, requesting approval to name room 133, Lanny Lede Hall, the Gregory and Brenda Hammer, Family Taco Bell Student Lounge and Research Center. This request is to recognize the longtime support and generosity that Gregory and Brenda Hammer have contributed to the Chef John Foe Culinary Institute. Item H4 from Nichols as well, approval to enter into a ground lease, lease back agreement with the Nichols State University Foundation to replace the scoreboard at the softball field. The foundation would fund the scoreboard replacement and complete the project at a cost of approximately $38,000. Upon completion of the project, the foundation will lease back to Nickel State and the university will make lease payments of approximately $17,000 that have been made available through funds collected from sponsorship funds to reduce the cost incurred by the foundation and donors. Upon completion of the project and payment from the university, the lease will terminate no later than February of next year, or at such a time a donation of improvement is executed, whichever comes first. Item H5 from Northwestern, university requesting board approval to enter into a contract to demolish Prudham Hall, <clears throat> which is a, a two-story residential facility was constructed in 1956, and also Caddo Hall, which is a three-story residential facility that was constructed in 1961. Item H6 from Northwestern, approval to name the Academic Success Center in Watson Library, the Gerald and Rose Long Academic Success Center. Mr. Long, who served in the Louisiana Senate for 12 years, and his late wife, Rose, provided ex extensive funding for the facility and for other projects and programs at the university during Mr. Long's many years as a business leader and a member of the legislature. Item 87 from Northwestern, requesting approval to name the stage at Everville Green Area, the Seven Oaks stage. The Student Government Association has proposed naming this stage to honor the first seven black students who enrolled in the university in 1965. Last item is H8 from Northwestern, approval to name the new meeting space in the Freeman Student Union, room 121, the Lucille M. Hendrick room. This request is to honor, honor the late Lucille Hendrick, who was a longtime Dean of Women at the university. H10 is from Southeastern, approval to enter into a ground lease with the Southeastern Louisiana University Foundation to establish the Southeastern Inter Interdisciplinary Innovation Center on the second floor of Sims Memorial Library. The renovations and enhancement, which will include furnishings and equipment of the center, is estimated to be $500,000. Upon completion of the project, the foundation will execute a donation to the university. The lease will, will terminate in December of 2022 or at such time until a donation of improvement is executed, whichever occurs first. Item H11, University of Louisiana at Lafayette requesting approval to name the Broussard Room in the, root, in the Roy House. The Bruce Sword family ties to the Acadian Heritage and UL Lafayette, together with the Center for Louisiana Studies, serving as a premier hub for the study of Louisiana's history and culture, and presents a unique opportunity to honor this family and pay tribute to them within historic Roy House. H12, University of Louisiana at Lafayette requesting approval to place on the signage of the newly installed softball video board in memory of Charles D. Charlie Bernard. Mr. Bernard was a passionate fan of Raging Cajun softball. 
He graduated from back then. It was USL in 1961, and he was a loyal supporter until he passed away. It is the university's request and in honor of Mr. Bar Bernard's passion and loyalty to Raging Cajun softball that the video board be named in his memory. Item H13, also from the University of Wisconsin at Lafayette, requesting approval to begin the process of an exchange of a parcel of land that is owned by the university in, in exchange for property that's currently owned by the city of Lafayette. The university desires to acquire the property currently identified as the fire station number five for the public purpose of expanding its campus in the city desires to acquire the university commons property for the public purpose of developing a new central fire station. The parties wish to execute an act of change in compliance with law. This will include appraisals and environmental impact reports done on both properties. The legal requirement is that there be an equal value of exchange with an equalizing payment if necessary and to obtain all other approvals required, required for e either party to complete the exchange. And finally, item H14 from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, approval of a lease for the primary care clinic by University Hospital and Clinics. The university currently owns a 15,000 square foot medical office that is known as the primary care clinic, and it's located on West Congress Street in Lafayette. This lease agreement benefits both the university and supports its mission to serve the community. In addition, providing additional source of revenue, it will assist in helping provide expanded health care services to the uninsured and the high risk Medicaid population within the community. The university desires the board to authorize this lease of the clinic to university hospital and clinics for a monthly rental amount of $16,000 for a term of five years with permitted extensions allowed by law and by mutual agreement of both parties. The rental amount is based on an appraisal by the Edward Ware Companies Incorporated. And that is all of the items, Mr. Kinchin. Bruce, thank you. Uh, all of the agenda items have been reviewed by the board and legal staff and are recommended for approval and are in accordance with uh, board rules and the board's policy and procedures memoranda. Motion to approve. If, <laughs> any questions or no, not here. Any questions? I have a motion from Mr. Romero to I, approve. Mr. Kitchen, Supervisor yes. Kitchen, I, I, I do have a couple of questions. On, on H4, that scoreboard um, ground lease, what, what is it, uh, lease back? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Is that, a, is that something common that we, is, is, we've done before or continue? Is that just a, yes, a, a known process? Yes, sir. Uh, 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 it is very common and it is allowed by our state law to enter into those agreements. And that is one way that the campus have, have been improving their facilities to get into, to get involved with a private party. But yes, it, it is very common and permitted. And I uh, uh, you know, want to comment that anytime we have these types agreements, uh, we have to query and Clark uh, always look at the executive summaries as well as the leases for approval. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Kitchen on, on uh, item H13, the exchange of property, um, it was mentioned that there would need to be appraisals and, and I think environmental impact study. Who, who is paying for those? Where, where are those costs? I would imagine that they would be, uh, usually in those types of situations, Dr. Clark, is that to the extent that we initiate something, whether it's legal or environmental, we would be obligated to pay for it. To the extent that the other party initiates something, whether it's legal or environmental, then it's up to them to, uh, to pay. That's the typical way in these sort of real estate agreements that uh, would, would take place. Is that, uh, Bruce, is that consistent with your understanding? Yes, sir. Okay. And in this case, we are the ones who initiated, correct? 
Um, I think from what I understand, it, it, it has been a mutual process that's been going on for some time. And uh, it is fairly new and all they're asking the board to do is strictly allow them to begin the process. But also too, Dr. Clark, uh, both parties may engage their own experts or consultants to, to help them in the process. And that's, you know, to the extent that uh, each party does that, then they would be responsible, you know, typically for the, for the consultants or experts that they engage. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. You're welcome. One quick thing from Steve Davidson, please uh, record me as an abstain on H1. Okay. Uh, any, any other comments, questions, or clarifications that need to uh, take place for the facilities planning committee agenda? Okay. Um, do, uh, you know, do I have a motion and a second for the approval of items H1 to H8 and H10 uh, to H14 with the abstention noted by Mr. Davidson? Move. Okay. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, Mr. Carter, uh, move, second for by uh, Mr. Condos. Uh, John, you that was, said that was Mr. Condos. My dogs were barking. So. <laughs> okay. yeah, yes, and so my dog's second as well. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we have a motion and a second for the approval of the items H1 to H8 and H10 to H14. Uh, any discussion on the motion and second? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Any other business at this time? If not, that completes the uh, business of the facilities planning committee. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over. All right. And the next committee presentation will be by Mr. Robinson for the finance committee. Thank you, sir. Call the order of the finance committee. Uh, we have uh, seven items on the agenda today, five of which are on the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Went will lead us with the, in that discussion. I would ask you to please, uh, when making a motion, please state your name so that uh, Ms. Carroll can capture it for the minutes. Mr. Went. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, members of the board and Dr. Henderson. Item I want on the agenda is McNeese State University's request for the approval for a referendum to allow changes to the allocation of student resources with the purpose of better serving the student body and the McNeese family. On December, 20, on December 3rd of 2020, uh, the SGA Senate passed a resolution proposing a referendum for the student vote uh, for this referendum. And it will have three functions to establish the Senator Expectations Program to codify a structured system for establishing Senator involvement, to change how student resources are allocated so the program can be funded, and then to create the SGA Senate Project Fund to allow senators to establish a substantial led, a substantial student led campus project. And I'll summarize the overall impact of this change in the structure and fee. <clears throat> Full time students attending fall, spring, and summer semesters will save $5 in, uh, on their fees. Full time students attending fall and spring semesters will save $2. Part-time students attending fall, spring, and summer uh, will uh, have no change in their costs. And part-time students attending fall, spring, fall and spring semesters will increase by $3. Based on the current en enrollment projections, the net savings on the entire student body compared to the current fees will be $13,000. <clears> okay. <throat> Item I-2 on the agenda is the University of New Orleans request to enter in, uh, for approval to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with Bastion Enterprises. UNO is requesting approval to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with Bastion Enterprises and the university's Advanced Materials Research Institute to develop, to develop tests and vaccines 
for the control of chronic wasting disease and other transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Bastion Enterprises is a Louisiana startup biology, biotechnology company working to develop tests and vaccines for the control of uh, CWD and other transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And AMRI is a recognized world leader in nanotech research. Uh, the project will allow for the exchange of ideas, development of new technologies involving uh, the two parties and UNO, and the characterization of materials prepared through the collaboration using state-of-the-art instrumentation, training undergraduate and graduate students uh, in, bio, in biomaterials, and the development of state and federal research proposals in basic applied research. The collaboration will serve the public through the development of a small business and technology that would and that would be Bastion Enterprises, which will employ Louisiana workers, including UNO students and graduates, <clears throat> serve to elevate UNO's faculty research programs through the development of new collaborative projects. Uh, we'll bring in additional federal funds through applied research programs and small business development grants, and will serve to train undergraduate students through internships and graduate students through collaborative projects. Item I-3 is the University of Louisiana System's request for the approval to establish endowed professorships and endowed superior graduate student scholarships and first generation scholarships as follows. At McNeese State University, the Francis X. Bride Professorship in Psychology. At Southeastern Louisiana University, the John Lario Endowed Professorship in Communication and Media Studies. The Bernice Ross Penland First Generation Endowed Scholarship the J.W. McClymans Endowed Professorship in Communication and Media Studies, the J.W. McClymans Endowed Professorship in Nursing and Health Sciences, and the Sanderson Farms First Generation Endowed Scholarship. At the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, the Barbara B. Audemont Endowed Professorship in Early Childhood Education, and the Roland and Betty Falk Endowed Superior Graduate Student Scholarship in Biology. At the University of Louisiana at Monroe, the Sally Lou and Kevin Co. First Generation Endowed Scholarship, the OIB First Generation Endowed Scholarship, the Lenore, the, the Lenore Francois Stewart and Dr. David W. Stewart Endowed Professorship, the Dorothy and Ray Young Family Endowed Professorship, and the Luffy First Generation Endowed Scholarship. At the U University of New Orleans, the Jera W. Johnson Endowed Professorship in Mean Marine Studies and World History, the Jera W. Johnson Endowed Professorship in Louisiana History, and the Endowed Superior Graduate Student Scholarship in Engineering and Applied Sciences Doctoral Program. And those, those requests are being made in accordance with uh, rules provided by the Louisiana Board of Regents. <clears throat> Item I-4 is the, the University of Louisiana System's request for approval of payments made by nonprofit organizations to the University of Louisiana Systems uh, Universities during the fiscal year 2020 in accordance with the provisions of Louisiana Revised Statute RS 173390F. Essentially, that statute um, requires that the board of supervisors approve those payments made to our uh, to those employees on behalf of the university and in accordance with our policy we're requesting that the board of supervisors for the university of louisiana system approve the schedule of payments made by nonprofit organizations to university employees during the fiscal year into june 30 2020 and indiv individual campuses submit quarterly reports of payments that exceed $1,000 made by nonprofit organization to university employees, which have been uh, compiled or included in the uh, schedule attached to the finance committee materials. Item I-5 is the University of Louisiana's financial status of alternatively financed projects for the six months ended uh, December 31st, 2020. Um, and I'm sorry, it, it uh, says uh, 2019, but it should be 2020. And that summary is also included 
and it uh, provides us a background or an idea of where we stand relative to housing and housing occupancy, and also in our ability to meet uh, the future obligations of the bonds that have financed those projects. Uh, our occupancy rates currently are ranging from approximately uh, 67% up to 95% uh, at our universities, like, excuse me, 102.4%. We do have one university that has overcapacity. Um, obviously, one of the, the biggest considerations or concerns that we've had is the effect of the uh, shutdown on our university's housing and our ability to meet those bond payments. And a part of the analysis that is included in your materials is an analysis of the, um, um, the uh, debt service coverage ratios, excuse me. And right now, um, the only one that uh, looks to be an issue would be McNeese, keeping in mind that McNeese has not been able to operate housing uh, thus far this academic year because of the hurricanes more so than because of the shutdown. Uh, we do expect that once they have students back on campus that we have housing available for them, then that debt service coverage ratio uh, will change. And that represents all of the items on the consent, consent agenda today. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, I'd be happy to entertain those. Are there questions, uh, comments from the board? Um, yes, Mr. Robertson, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> when, can any of the COVID relief funds uh, that are uh, sent to the universities, can they be used to uh, satisfy any of these bond indebtedness? Um, uh, Ms. Donahoe, it's, there's not a direct um, as I understand it, there's not a direct provision or provision that allows for a direct, direct uh, payment of the bonded debt. However, there is relief in the COVID funds uh, and there's a second round that's gonna be coming. And I, I believe that it will provide for some relief uh, with lost revenues due to COVID. Now that's in the COVID relief package. And those lost revenues obviously would be student housing. Uh, McNeese's case is going to be a little bit different because the primary loss of revenue for their housing after X period is the hurricanes. And uh, I don't want to uh, speak uh, necessarily for the university, but there's a possibility that they could look at uh, where they were in the spring compared to where they were in the fall percentage wise and say X amount possibly would have been lost revenues. The other uh, portion would be lost revenues from the, the shutdown of the dormitories uh, or the other housing projects. But again, that is for others to analyze. And I don't know if, uh, if anyone from McNeese, uh, Dr. Burkell, if you're here and you have any comments on that or Dr. Henderson. Yeah, uh, Charles. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you know one of the uh, ways that we can get some of that revenue back is through uh, our insurance through lost revenue because of the hurricane. So while we have COVID impacts, the uh, hurricane impact should be covered for uh, lost revenue through ORM for the hurricane losses. Uh, this is Virgil Robinson. Is there any uh, any uh, any assistance available through FEMA for lost revenue? No, sir. Uh, we, we don't. Uh, it has to come through our insurance. And we do have that with ORM. We're just waiting on payment from uh, Office of Risk Management from the state uh, so we can settle up on what those lost revenues were. Mm, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any, other, any further questions? Quick quick question, uh, Supervisor Robinson, on, on item I-1, that referendum. Uh, we, we are voting to approve the students to be able to vote on that. Is that that's correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Yeah, this is, it's, it's a referendum to allow what was passed by the Student Senate, the SGA Senate. It, uh, it's a referendum to allow that referendum to be put to a vote by the students. 
And then my question would simply be, do we know how that will be conducted in this era of COVID? Is it uh, online? Is it, uh, you know, how, how do you do uh, that? These, these votes generally are online, Mr. Clark, anyway. They're not in person. And so every student will be given uh, information on how to vote and uh, have the opportunity to vote on these. <laughs> and these fees are basically a repurposing of existing fees to go to uh, some new items that, or I say uh, alternate items that the uh, SGA believes would better serve their student population. I, I sincerely appreciate that and, and appreciate the fact that the students are looking at, at, at ways to, you know, better serve their, their own circumstances and the fact that there's a savings associated with this particular redistribution is, is certainly encouraging. So thanks so much. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Are there further comments, uh, questions? Are there any comments from the public? If not, I accept a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda item one through five. Well, Adana, so move. Donna, second. Second. Condos. Mr. Condo, second. Any objection? Without objection, the that is approved. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, two items for discussion. Uh, Mr. Jeanette, you're going to uh, do item six. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Robinson, members of the board, Dr. Henderson. Item I-6 is Universal Within Assistance Report on Internal and External Audit Activity since our last board meeting. Covers the period of November 30th, 2020 to February 21st, 2021. Each of you were sent a list of internal and external reports that have been completed by various auditors since our last meeting. Also included our internal audits that are currently in progress and a timetable for follow-up recommendations that have been made in previous reports. I have all of the reports that were issued should any of you want to see the entire report. And at this time, I did not know any concerns that should be brought up at this time. This is a report only and no action by the board is necessary. Thank you, Mr. Janae. Uh, are there any comments, uh, questions from the board on the audit findings and audit reports that you received earlier? Recognizing none, we will go on to uh, item seven. Uh, Mr. Winch, will you handle that please? Yes, sir. Item seven is a review of the quarterly reports for the quarter into December 31st of 2020. And as usual, there are always lots of reports uh, that are attached. I don't go through the individual reports but I would like to highlight some items that I think warrant attention from the board. And again, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to ask, uh, to stop me and ask me. Um, as it relates to revenues, our self-generated funds, which represent primarily our tuition and fee revenues, uh, totaled $438 million or 65.4% of our total budget for the year. And that would be consistent, I believe, in a percentage uh, compared with other years. And that represents a one half of 1% decrease uh, from the second quarter of fiscal 2020. Given the circumstances over the past year with the shutdown and with the hurricanes, uh, the 0.5% decrease, I think, is pretty encouraging. We are essentially uh, unchanged from one year to the next when you look at what those percent what when you look at what that change is which is about two million dollars uh, our total revenues reported are 528.4 million or 61.8 percent of the budgeted amount which represents an approximate an approximate 5.9 percent decrease compared to the second quarter of 2020 of that 5.9% decrease, $29.6 million of it is a decrease in state appropriations. And if you'll recall, and for our new members, <clears throat> the state provided some assistance through a supplemental appropriation, which we refer to as House Bill 307. And there was essentially a revenue swap from fiscal 
2021 into fiscal 2020 from some additional aid that the state had received. And so our net, uh, our, our 2021 appropriations were decreased, but the 2020 appropriations were increased. And we're actually at a net decrease in our appropriation of about $6 million over the two year period. Uh, so that's why those numbers, when you look at some of those numbers, they are a little confusing. And uh, trust me, it was hard enough working with it relative to the budget and to uh, explanations before, and it still remains pretty confusing. On the expense side, our personal services are $300.8 million, which actually equate to right at 50% which is consistent with a four quarter year and your four, four quarters of expenses. Our operating services are at 71% and instruction research and student related expenses are 72.3% at this point. And again, when you have your academic years and you have specific periods where you incur a bulk of your expenses, that's also uh, fairly consistent. Uh, expenses through the second quarter total $451 million, which is 52.8% of the total budget and represents a decrease of about $14.5 million or 3.1% in increases, which is again encouraging considering we have the, uh, the impacts on revenues from decreases in appropriations. On non-athletic activities, our auxiliary enterprise revenues uh, to date, total $95.6 million and $57.2 million for expenses, compared to $135 million and $70 million for revenues and expenses, respectively, through the second quarter of fiscal 2020. And we've seen the highest impact in our housing revenues, as well as in the contracted services or meal plans, et cetera, servicing those universities. Uh, I'll highlight a few areas where there have been uh, decreases that, that may result in current year deficits uh, in activities in, in auxiliaries. And that's gonna be uh, McNeese with 1.4 million in its self-operated bookstore, Northwestern at 1.1 million for for contracted services. Uh, ULL had 400, uh, approximately $442,000 for its self-operated bookstore. And UNO, approximately 809,000 for its self-operated student housing. And again, we can trace the effects to those decreases or those uh, deficits primarily to COVID and to the hurricanes. In <laughs> athletics, our athletics uh, projection uh, is $96.8 million in revenues, uh, which is a decrease of $18.5 million from the previous year. And total projected expenses total $114 million, which is a decrease of uh, $3 million. And that's keeping in mind that there are a lot of expenses in athletics that are fixed from year to year. That includes, for example, student scholarships. And then on the revenue side, of course, losing ticket sales and some of the conference distributions and also some of the um, uh, game guarantees that some of the universities have experienced from, from game cancellations, et cetera. And I think that some of those game guarantees may still be paid, but uh, that's not settled yet. And uh, of course, also, we had a number of universities who did not have fall football, and there is some football, I think, being played now. We've also, I've also listed the current year surplus, well, deficits in athletics, um, because these are primarily a direct result of the effects of COVID, and they're something that the university system is going to have to deal with in the universities, I believe. But Grambling and Nichols currently are projecting that they'll break even, and that's likely because of uh, some uh, football being played in the spring, but also from operating transfers. And then Louisiana Tech is projecting 1.7 million in a deficit, McNeese 4 million, uh, Northwestern 400,000, Southeastern 800,000. 
ULL 7.7 .7 million, ULM at 2 million, and UNO at about $700,000. Also, we have restricted funds that are either statutorily restricted or they're restricted uh, by the, uh, the Board of Supervisors or other external uh, restricted amounts. So we report those. And that chart will show that we are about $686,000 higher this year over the prior, uh, thus far this year, over the prior uh, December 31, 2020. And that's consistent with mid-year balances. Uh, and, and currently we don't see any significant issues or concerns with those fund balances in those, those fees. And that concludes my report on the um, quarterly per performance. So if anyone has any questions again, I'll be happy to uh, respond to any of those as much as possible. Questions, please. Mr. Winter, I have one question. Uh, are we requiring or are we beginning the process to uh, discuss with the schools looking at a three or five year budget process that's going to allow them to uh, show how they're going to come back uh, from, this, from those deficits? especially in the athletics area? I'll leave that to Dr. Henderson. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, absolutely we are. We are still, there are still some uh, federal dollars that are materializing. Yeah. Uh, one of the variables. There is also the question of some game guarantees that uh, we are working uh, collaboratively with, with several other institutions that were affected by that. And we're working with our legal counsel on that. So far, it has been a... Uh, a, a collegial rather than adversarial conversation with the schools that, that uh, we believe owe those game guarantees or some portion of those, uh, that conversation over the next 30 days uh, will be one that we'll have to consider uh, a change in the nature of that conversation. I realize it's real early now, but uh, as we get through the remainder of this year, I don't know that there's going to be any money showing up from the state of Louisiana that's going to be able to buffer some of those deficits. So those universities that have those deficits are going to have to be creative in their processes and figure out how they're going to or where money is going to come from in order to be able to uh, get back to a break even within a reasonable time. I realize you don't do it over 12 months, it may be 24 months, but there has to be a plan. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and we will have a, a, a very formal report on that at the next board meeting as these, some of these other questions get answered. That'll address, I do expect the, a, the predominance of those to be addressed this year with some of the revenues that are coming in. Okay. Uh, and then I'll have a little bit of information about the, uh, not to steal anybody's thunder that might make an announcement tomorrow about the state of state finances going forward. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Recognizing none, those were reports did not require any action on behalf of the board. Um, is there further business to come before this committee? If not, Mr. Chair, I yield the chair back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. The next committee report will be the personnel committee by Ms. Dono. Thank you very much, Chair Carter. We have three items on the personnel committee agenda today. They're being presented on the consent agenda and one item is for discussion only. Dr. Marcus Jones will provide an overview of each item. Dr. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Dunhoe. Good afternoon, Chairman Carter, Dr. Henderson, and board members. Item J1 is Nipple State University's request for approval to appoint Dr. Michelle Caruso as Vice President of Student Affairs effective January the 4th. 2021. Item J2, University of Louisiana at Lafayette's request for approval to, to appoint, appoint uh, Mr. Michael McClure as Interim Dean of the College of Arts, effective January the 1st, 2021. And item J3, University of Louisiana at Monroe's request to appoint Ms. Lisa Frey Miller as Interim Vice President of Enrollment Management and University Relations, effective February the 15th, 2021. Ms. Dunningho, that concludes the items to be considered. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Jones. All these items on this agenda have been reviewed by staff and are recommended for approval. Of course, if any member has any questions or comments, um, we'll entertain them at this time. Are there any comments from the public? If uh, hearing none, we'll have a voice, voice vote to approve these items. All in favor, say yes. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. We have the item for discussion. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jones, if you'll review that for us, please. Item J4 is a discussion of the U University of Louisiana Systems Policy and Procedures Memorandum on leave record establishment and regulations for all unclassified non-civil service employees. The PPM has been updated to bring it in line with Louisiana Revised Statute 17 colon 3312, use of sick leave, which allows for an employee to take sick leave, not only when he or she is ill or has a medical appointment, but also to care for an immediate family member who is ill or injured, or to accompany an immediate family member to a medical, dental, or optical consultation or treatment. An immediate family member means a spouse, parent, or a child of an employee. This language uh, on use of sick leave for an immediate family member contained in the statute has been added to the system's PPM on leave record establishment. No other changes were made to the PPM. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Jones. Do we have any other business at this time? Any comments from the board? Or questions? Any comments from the public? Hearing not, I'll yield my time over to the next committee. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think some of the presidents are, are on and they have some of the, uh, the new hires that uh, I think want to say have a few words. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jay Clune. Um, jump right in. I have Dr. Michelle Caruso, who is our Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, she's been with the university since 1996, uh, came to us with two degrees from the University of New Orleans, both her bachelor's and her master's degree. Uh, she served on the University of Louisiana System Workforce uh, Workplace Inclusion Task Force and has been instrumental in diversity and inclusion efforts. And uh, she has been indispensable to me since I arrived here three years ago. And I want to introduce Dr. Michelle Cruz. So I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. J.T. Terrell as well. Uh, so he can jump on right after. Uh, Jonathan Terrell is our new athletic director. He played uh, quarterback, which I didn't know, and wide receiver for the Colonels during his playing days. He, he coached for us in the, in the 90s and, and in the early 2000s. Uh, he is uh, directly the cause of our recent enrollment growth. He has three daughters, a nephew, a son-in-law who are Nichols alums or Nichols students currently, and he has another son and a granddaughter in the pipeline. So I'll start with Dr. Caruso. Thank you, Dr. Clune, Chair Carter, board members, Dr. Henderson, and all of the system administrators. I appreciate you allowing a few minutes for us to share a few words with you this morning. Um, I never underestimate how blessed I am to be a part of the Nickel State University family as well as the University of Louisiana system family. And I also know how blessed I am for the opportunity I have to continue to impact students' lives in this particular current role. I'm so grateful for so many people that have been with me along this journey in higher education, many of whom are on the call today, uh, for being mentors to me for being collaborators and for being allies and friends. Uh, my whole experience at this level of administration has been um, COVID, literally, um, which has enhanced the intensity of the challenge, but also the intensity of the reward and the productivity that we have all experienced and I certainly have as well. There's still so much for us to do in higher education. These are really critical times, as we all know, in the lives of both our traditional and our non-traditional students. And I so very much look forward to continuing this work and contributing to advancing the mission of our university as well as of our system. And I appreciate you all very much. Thank you. Uh, JT. 
Thank you, Chair Carter and Dr. Henderson, Dr. Kloon, uh, for once taking a, a chance on a young man who is an alum, uh, come from a whole different background. I'm so grateful uh -huh. to Google State University, to the UL system, but I bleed red and silver, that's for sure. Uh, I do have a pipeline. Uh, I make sure that my children have children so they can come to Nickel State. <laughs> but uh, it has been a blessing. Uh, this is a whirlwind. I know people talk about the obstacles and things that we all face, but uh, I'm also so grateful for the opportunity uh, to be sitting in this chair to um, make an impact on young men and women uh, every day as, as we go and lead um, to, to compete not only to compete, not only to compete, but to uh, leave them with a, a lasting view of uh, what real life is about. So um, I'm glad to be sitting here to be able to help uh, bring all of these young men and women together as one and as colonels. So uh, I just thank you again and so grateful for the opportunity. Well, good afternoon. This is Ron Berry from ULM. Uh, it's uh, Chairman Carter, Dr. Henderson, board members. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Lisa Miller to you today. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, Lisa is certainly no stranger to ULM. Uh, she has a history of uh, working at ULM for uh, 17 years. She started as director of recruitment and admissions and in that position turned an eight year downward trend in enrollment around completely for us. Uh, so she's been instrumental in ULM success for a long time. She moved from that position to an assistant vice president of enrollment management, where she worked for eight years. And then uh, lastly, she served the university as our chief communications officer. Uh, she has a tremendous reputation in the academic community. Uh, she's taught in the local school systems, been a counselor. She's earned two degrees from ULM. Uh, and, and it is truly an honor for me to uh, thank you for appointing her as our, our really first interim vice president of enrollment management and uh, university relations and the second VP, female VP in the history of our institution. Uh, so uh, Ms. Miller was, is with us today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Miller. Here we go. Thank you, President Barry. It's hard for me to say President Barry because I think he started at about the time I did uh, 16 years ago and uh, we were colleagues. And so it's certainly an honor to be a part of his team and to work with what I know his vision is for this university. Uh, I'd like to also thank Dr. Henderson and all the board members and my colleague friends that I've made at the system office. And I promise to bring a big bag of those chocolate turtles the next time I come. Uh, this is truly for me a dream come true. Um, I often start many press conferences or events by saying it's a great day on the bayou. And for me, I have to say today is the best day on the Bayou for me. And uh, I know great things are ahead of us. Uh, I grew up here at the university. My grandparents had a pharmacy across the street from the university. And so there are not many events that I've missed in my lifetime here. And uh, as, as Ron mentioned, uh, I have spent an extensive amount of time in the world of education in this region. And so I feel like I, I know the culture very well in terms of students and what it means for recruitment and marketing to those students and to help push that agenda for access and social mobility for our students that not only will make a difference in their lives, but the lot the, than our community overall. So um, it's a little bittersweet to me to do this by Zoom today because I'd love to be with all of you and to shake hands and hug necks, but uh, I look forward to being with all of you um, these next few years. Thank you. I conclude the presentations of uh, new uh, position holders. We'll I believe so, Chair Carter. So we'll turn it over to you. All right.
right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Donahoe. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be conducted by Ms. Roussel, um, who is the Legislation Committee Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman Carter, I appreciate it. The regular session of the Louisiana Legislature is scheduled to begin on April 12th. Cami Geisman is here to give an update on how the system is preparing for the upcoming session. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Russell and Chair Carter, Dr. Henderson. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief report on what's coming up in the legislature. Uh, we've been preparing for session for the past since the beginning of the year. We start. We kicked off um, in on January 6th with our first legislative roundtable with you all, Lafayette. We've held eight throughout the state th thus far. We have two more scheduled for next month. And um, we've just been spending time with legislators. It's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, meet with legislators and have their attention for a couple of hours to remind them of the power of the system and why it's important. And also answer some questions about higher education, the structure of higher education. And uh, it's been very um, wonderful experience, very optimistic with group. Um, I think we're, we're, on a good, we're in a good place. Um, we've had, uh, a time with about 50 legislators and that'll only grow with our next two meetings. Uh, board members, some of you have been able to come to our round tables. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, and interacting with our legislators. I, I know y'all, especially in your home, have those relationships and those are really important and we hope you've enjoyed them, uh, but I'm really appreciative. So at the end of um, each uh, meeting, we ask, I just wanna share our legislative priorities. We have two legislative priorities to restore our state investment to the FY19 level, um, and then to close that competition gap and invest in our faculty. So those are our priorities, they're really simple. Of course, they take funding, but uh, we're, we're gonna work really hard to ensure that, that those are done this, this session. So um, last month we sat in a, a budget presentation with the commissioner's office, uh, the division administration, and um, the outlook wasn't overly positive, but we think some things have shifted and we, we think we're going to have a, um, his presentation to the joint committee on the budget is tomorrow. And so we will know exactly where we stand tomorrow or kind of our starting point. And that starting point will work from there to uh, on our strategy of what we can do to make sure these priorities happen. So we'll know more about the budget, to the executive budget tomorrow. Um, the only other thing I want to share with you is that we have chosen a date for your system day at the Capitol. We love your system day at the Capitol. It's one of our favorite days of the year. It's so fun to have so many people out supporting our system. Unfortunately, in our current environment, we don't think it's safe to have 1500 people on the Capitol lawn. It is a large lawn, but maybe not quite that large. And so we are going to have a virtual day. We've already started talking about ways we can engage legislators, ways we can engage students. Um, We'll have some very specific programming for that day that will feature our institutions as well as our students, our faculty, and our legislators. We're going to involve our legislators. It's also the day that higher ed will be in front of the uh, House Education, no, the House um, Budget Committee. And so that uh, will be part of our day. We'll, we'll encourage uh, students, faculty, and staff to tune in and, and kind of get involved in the process, understand the process even better. And then, of course, we'll have a significant social media push um, along with that as well. Uh, there will be a, there's a lot of planning to do. It's uh, a couple months away, but we will have more details on how y'all can be involved ahead of that April 14th date. But I just want to go ahead and let you know that um, that would be coming up. And, and that's really all I have, unless anyone has any questions. Uh, this is a report only. No actions required of the board. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Any comments from the public? Do we have any other business at this time? And if not, that concludes the business of the Legislation Committee. I send it back to you, Chairman Carter. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> now we'll have a report by our, our system president, Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would never want to get out in front of uh, tomorrow's uh, presentation, uh, but the two priorities that Cami referenced to you, I think we will see in the executive budget, we will have made significant ground. Uh, and I will leave it at that, but uh, I'm very, very bullish on this legislative session. And to be honest, a, 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 a significant part of it is because of the work that's being done by our faculty and staff across the state on delivering on our mission. And uh, I'm very, very pleased. I, again, I, I wish I could say more, 
with the announcements tomorrow. So I would like to shift real quickly to, to and, and, and let me first also say I, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Governor Edwards, uh, to Commissioner Darden, of course, Deputy Commissioner Goodson, uh, for, for their work in, in very challenging times. There's so many moving pieces to this, to the budget preparation, and, and, and they, have, uh, they have been great friends to higher education, not for institution's sake, but for the students' sake and for the faculty's sake and for the good of the state. And uh, another example of that happened this last week. Uh, Governor Edwards, he announced expansion of eligibility for COVID-19 vaccinations uh, to some new populations. And this is the tier of who gets it now. Uh, but they also ensured that higher education, our faculty and staff, our institutions are included in what's called phase 1B tier 2. We are currently in phase 1B and an expanded tier 1. Uh, and tier 2 will be next up. Uh, in, in tier one, we have already been able to vaccinate our nursing and allied health faculty and students. We've also been able to vaccinate uh, faculty, staff, and uh, associated members of the community that, that meet other eligibility criteria. But prioritizing higher education faculty and staff in, in, in the vaccine distribution uh, is, is a great testament to how much we value these public facing servants who are essential to deliver of education in our state. Uh, we have done, uh, through the magic of, of Caitlin Wilkerson and creating some survey tools and with uh, Claire Norris, who you will hear from shortly and creating data, data visualizations, we've done some great rich surveys of faculty and staff, nearly 5,000 of them responded uh, on information related to the vaccines. And we'll be able to share that with you in the future. Uh, very quickly, Title IX and the Academic Summit. I wanna I want invite Ms. Erica Cowley to talk about the Title IX work that she's been doing. You know, Title IX is, is something that, that you don't hear about quite often unless there's a challenge. And, and you might've seen some, some newspaper coverage and, and media coverage of some Title IX issues around the country, certainly even in Louisiana. Uh, you don't hear much about Title IX absent an acute issue. And I thought it'd be helpful for the board to understand the work that, that Erica leads in that area. She'll also give you an update on the upcoming academic summit. So Erica, if you would. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. One of the most disturbing calls that parents can receive is that their son and daughter has been sexually assaulted. Another disturbing call that parents can receive is that their son or daughter has been accused of sexual assault. No one wins, neither the alleged victim nor the alleged perpetrator. I know that in loco parentis is a, a term that is rarely used these days. However, the idea of the term still exists on our campuses. We're committed to the safety and welfare of our students. Over the years, we have been intentional about the work that we have been doing on our campuses related to sexual violence prevention and Title IX efforts. Our students are being educated about sexual violence prevention and their rights. Faculty, staff, leaders of student organizations, and athletic staff are provided information about Title IX, either in face-to-face -face settings, virtual settings, or electronically through email. For example, McNeese State University's current Title IX coordinator, Mr. Kedrick Nicholas, conducts a training called 10 Minutes with Title IX for faculty and staff on his campus. In his presentation, Mr. Nichols, Nicholas talks about Title IX basics, jurisdiction, and violation reporting. This is just one example of what type of Title IX education takes place on our campuses. Because we want to work to change our campus's culture as it relates to sexual violence prevention, we have taken another step in becoming proactive. We have partnered with a nonprofit organization called STAR, which stands for Sexual Trauma Awareness and Response. This organization supports victims of sexual violence as well as provides sexual violence prevention education. We have contracted with STAR to help us create a framework for enhancing our existing work. SAR also will be at our pre-conference, will be our pre-conference keynote on Wednesday, March 17th 
and we'll discuss strategies to mitigate sexual assault on our campuses. In April, STAR will also provide a workshop with Title IX personnel. We are excited about this new partnership. Something else we have done recently is submitted, we submitted a letter of intent to the Department of Justice's Office on Violence, I'm sorry, Department of Justice's Office through the Violence Against Women um, Office for a grant aimed to reduce domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. We will be working on the grant proposal in the coming weeks. We are optimistic about this grant as the purpose aligns well with our goals to mitigate sexual violence on the campus. Any questions before I move on to, academic, to the academic summit? No. Thank you. So this year's academic summit is scheduled for March 24th and 25th and will be held virtually. Our keynote panel will discuss, will consist of interdisciplinary teams from Northwestern State University and Louisiana Tech University. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Jacqueline Harris of Grambling State University. Dr. Harris currently serves as a member of Governor John Bell Edwards COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force analyzing COVID-19 data used to monitor the spread of COVID-19 in Louisiana's population. She will lead the panelists in discussing their work with, with COVID-19 research and strategies that they have been implementing in the classroom. Please let me know if you're interested in attending. Thank you very much, Dr. Henderson. Erica, thank you very much. It continues to do extraordinary work uh, in, in, in several areas, most of them dealing with students, most of them dealing with very important uh, issues like Title IX, uh, like hazing, uh, in, in so many different areas. And, and I can't thank her enough for her leadership on that. Uh, we have an upcoming event, of course, of For Our Future Conference. It's the fourth annual For Our Future Conference. Uh, the co virtual conference will be held March 18th and 19th. The program includes a keynote presentation by Zheng Zhao, He's an expert in educational leadership and, uh, and extraordinarily entertaining in a substantive way. He, he talks a lot about globalization, future of work, and how that impacts education. Looking forward to that. We have more than 60 breakout sessions associated with the conference, uh, including one titled Reflections and Inspirations from a Student Perspective. That's by someone who's no stranger to you. It's our immediate past student member, Rachel Lodiger, and of course, our current student member, Olivia Bailey. We invite you to register and participate in the conference as your schedule allows. Carol will email you the registration link if you don't have it, but she'll, even if you do have it, she's going to email it to you. So you'll get you'll get in your email. That a visualization, as you know, last year we 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 added Tableau as our data visualization tool, and it's expanded our ability to analyze and display data, and that's great. But the data that goes into it has to be meaningful it has to be uh important and that comes from a lot of conversations a lot of collaboration and leadership from another member of our staff that's dr claire norris she's going to share with you a bit about how this work is going help, help with the analytics and talk about how we then we use that to inform our future practice claire. thanks dr henderson i and you know i just want to take a moment um typically you need your leaders to invest in things that are important. And so Dr. Henderson invested in data and data visualization. And so I am so thankful for that. Um, he has allowed us to inform our campus communities in ways that we, we've really never been able to do before. So thank you for that. Um, I am going to take a moment in the presentation um, for board members who've been on the board for a while. You likely have heard some of this stuff before, but we do have new board members. So I'd like to just kind of catch them up. Um, so, um, Jesse, if we go to the next slide. So prior to moving into this role, a lot of the work had started around diversity and inclusion. And it started with a strategic framework that was committed to producing the most educated and prepared generation in our state's history. And we understood that to achieve that goal, we had to have a commitment to diversity. And so this board approved this commitment where we are working to ensure 
that our um, students, faculty, and staff are reflective of the communities they serve. And so that was a big and bold statement that um, helped us to set a path and stay the course. Um, and also in that time, this board approved the Reginald F. Lewis Educational Equity Initiative, which has really served as an umbrella to house a lot of our equity initiatives. And I do believe that there's an opportunity as we continue to do this great work for us to pursue um, external partnerships as well as grant funding under the Educational Equity Initiative. So thank you for that. Next slide, Jesse. So some of the work that we're accelerating, again, I know you guys, some of you have heard this before, but I just wanna remind you, the board, and introduce it to those who are new. We are increasing diversity in our talent and leadership pipeline. We're intentional about that. Um, we are increasing access and success across all populations. We're investing in and partnering with mm -hmm. organizations that are committed to equity. We're expanding trainings um, and educational resources for our system. And again, we're using data to advance equity. Next slide, please. So I just want to remind the board that um, uh, on June 25th, about seven, month, seven months ago, we made some commitments to you. And those commitments, we promised you an framework. We promised you these external partnerships. And one of those partnerships was Natahi and Laihi. We promised you to create advisory boards to inform us of good practice. Um, we also said that we'd implement and administer campus climate surveys to assess our campus climate. And again, the data piece. Each of those things that we promised, we have done. And so I'm excited to say that. And I know it seems like um, maybe an easy lift, but I will tell you the system staff along with our campus um, faculty and staff have been instrumental in moving that forward. So we modeled, we um, developed and modeled our equity framework after NASH, the National Association for System Heads. Um, this is a national um, sort of framework that is informed by experts in the area of diversity and inclusion. And there are nine buckets that are essential to pay attention to as we move the needle forward around diversity and equity. I won't go through all of them because you can sort of get a sense for what they mean, but I will stop at leadership. And I, I, it dawned on me as I, I looked at this framework, how important leadership has been in investing in the right tools, to um, adopting diversity commitments uh, and, and creating a framework that's inclusive, um, but also supporting faculty and staff um, and, and leadership. Um, and you know, I, I wanna point out that this equity framework has been driving some of the work we're doing. Um, I was notified by Dr. Khan recently that as you look at curriculum and co-curriculum, how can we be more diverse and inclusive? McNeese State is in the process of creating an undergraduate certificate or proposing an undergraduate certificate in the area of diversity and inclusion to strengthen our students' awareness and, and response, um, well, cultural competency, right, in, in the area of diversity and inclusion. So we'll just keep moving here. So we had um, two CDOs who are absolutely amazing, who, who came to us and asked um, that we establish a Latahi chapter um, for to better support um, our uh, chief diversity officers. Natahi is the National Association for Diversity Officers in Higher Education. And so we thought, how can we better support um, our um, diversity officers in Louisiana? As you guys know, this work is not easy, and, and sometimes it feels um, quite lonely and hard, um, and that's okay, but if we, we created this chapter to better support each other and leverage the resources that we have. This chapter will consist of, um, or will, will consist of members from both public and um, private institutions around our state. We've submitted the application, and we're just awaiting final approval. So we're excited to announce that to you. This is something that the UL system envisioned and um, we pulled it together and we believe it's going to have an impact on the entire state. 
So we also said we needed to create advisory boards because obviously even as someone who sits in the, the um, CDO sort of capacity, I have blind spots. And so we know that if, if we invite others to the table, we can cover those blind spots. And I, I you know, I, Dr. Walton teed me up pretty nicely to talk about the Digital Equity and Inclusion Task Force, DEEP, that was established. Um, my colleague, Katie Dawson, has been instrumental in helping me with this task force and putting it together and, and making sure to facilitate it in a way that's meaningful. Um, that Digital Equity and Inclusion Task Force not only um, sought to ensure access, but the inclusion part is critical. So it's not useful to have access without ensuring that there's some digital competencies um, that um, align with the technology. And so we have um, created this task force to help us identify issues around digital equity and inclusion. And that's ADA compliance that is looking at things like mental health and ensuring that our faculty are prepared to deal with that in the virtual world. Um, so we, I, I want to remind you also that out of the deep, um, well, out of the digital equity and inclusion task force, we had the bridging the divide series and I'll touch on that a little later, but I, I do want to let you know that we, we've come together and, and work through that. We also have established a black male advisory council. Um, and we, we wanted to make sure to be laser focused on providing support to black male faculty, um, staff and students. And so we have a number of folks from our campuses who are excited to do this great work. And we have created a, a, four subcommittees to ensure that we have sort of a holistic look at these outcomes and that student experience, faculty and staff development, summit programming and external partnerships. Um, I won't announce more about the, the summit programming because we're in the process of thinking through it, but it's exciting work and I promise you'll hear more about it very soon. Next slide, please. I'll move through this quickly. Um, every other year, the system administers campus climate surveys um, and it's that time again. And I'm, I think this is the best time ever because we can um, kind of lead in, in understanding how the, the campus climate looks from a sort of comprehensive outlook. Um, but what we did this year is I met with all the CDOs and we said, how can we expand our campus climate surveys to pick up um, measures of diversity and inclusion, but also issues around COVID-19 and the digital divide. So those surveys are actually um, being administered right now. Data will be available in the summer of 2021. Um, and so please be prepared for the update on that. Um, I talked about this idea of bridging the divide. One of the things that was so important to us is that we didn't just give folks access to technology, but it was bigger than that. We wanted to be inclusive about how we went about that. Um, next slide, please. And so we created four um, tracks that we thought was very important for us to address, but each of these tracks were embedded in equity. So technology and tools for online learning, we wanted to offer professional development to our faculty and staff, ensuring that they were able to um, provide support in the area of technology and tools for all populations. Quality matters, we embedded an equity lens into that, making sure we included all students in our training and our faculty were prepared to provide that, that um, quality um, instruction to their students, all students. Um, innovative and engaging course content. We had um, a faculty member who created a, a course um, that was called the escape room, a virtual escape room to strengthen um, their, um, th their professional development for, for their peers in the area of being innovative and, and engaging that course content. And finally, student success, obviously, 
um, we wanted to make sure that we were paying attention to ADA compliance, that we were paying attention to populations who may have been um, experiencing social, social isolation during these times. And so each of these tracks, we had over 70 professional development courses that were offered by our very own faculty and staff. We leveraged the power um, that we had internally and, and really moved mountains. Again, I, I need to tip my hat off to Katie Dawson. This was kind of her brainchild. Um, and so she just really put the work into this and, and, and we're forever grateful. These courses are still available to all our faculty and staff. They live in a repository. So hurricane pandemic, we've created a sustainable solution for our faculty and staff. Next slide, please. So the last piece I'll, I'll cover is how we're using data to advance our equity work. We got Tableau in July. Dr. Henderson said, let's invest, let's, let's make it happen. Collectively, our folks have put together over 850 dashboards. Um, we did a call for it. We've had system dashboards, campus dashboards. We use it for COVID understanding, better understanding of COVID resources. And here are just some quick snapshots of some of the work that's been done. You can see that we're looking at top management teams in, a, in diversity in a new way, but also around our admissions dashboards. Who are we, um, who's applying, who are we admitting, and who's enrolling? We're, we're asking those questions. And then um, if we move to the next slide, I wanted to give you a better sort of snapshot of what's happening. Here, UNO did something pretty unique um, they basically said, you know, we'd like a better understanding of sort of what's happening regionally as folks apply to our system. And I know it's not the best view. We'll dig in just a little bit more. And I wanted to respect privacy of students. But you can see here, you can drill down by demographic. You can drill down by region. And you can better understand the patterns of how students are applying and being admitted by their demographics. So as we, and, and I should mention, and Dr. Henderson usually gets weepy when I do this, this is real time. This is real time. So if UNO is hit by a hurricane, they can watch the pattern of their students, their demographics in real time. And they can create initiatives and um, policies, procedures to, and, and support for their students. So this is exciting. Next slide, Jesse. So, I, I wanted to really pause for a moment and show you two dashboards um, that are really interactive and you can better at, you can better ask questions if that makes sense, but you can also better answer questions. So um, Jesse, if you don't mind clicking on that first link, Northwestern team um, has been instrumental in moving us forward in terms of looking at our real time data. And typically IR teams, take snapshots of data and we look at that and we use that data to make decisions. And it's almost as if sometimes we're chasing trailing metrics. But what's happened here is we are getting live updates on students movement through the pipeline. So um, the Northwestern team um, has created this dashboard where you're able to look at headcount and the day-to-day -day changes. And many of you might think things aren't changing, but as we've become more innovative in our course offerings, we need to know the patterns of students. So Jesse's hovering over three SEH hours. That is typically our dual enrollment students. We're able to see what they're doing, um, but we're also able to see how that impacts tuition and fees. And so these are the types of real decisions, um, real-time decisions that we are able to make um, to better inform our campuses and better help us support our campuses. Um, Jess, can we go back to that other link, please? UL Lafayette has also done some amazing work. I told them to just go ahead, hey, do something fancy for the board so they could see how, how neat this, this tool is. And so they put this together, not overnight, but um, pretty quickly. So this is just a high level look at their completers. And so just to ensure that they had the equity lens, they added co the college to um, look at completers by college. But this gets a little bit fancier. So Jesse's gonna hover over, I mean, click on education. And so you'll notice that there's some gender disparities in terms of completers 
in, in, in terms of education. And if you scroll down just a tad, Jess, you'll also see what happens by race. Now, Jesse's gonna click over to engineering just to show you um, what the change. And you'll notice our model shifts a little bit. You notice there's, again, gender disparities, but there's also race disparities. And so we know where to be laser focused because of this type of data. Um, I, and so that's really wraps up my presentation. I'm ready to take any questions, but I, I just wanna thank all the folks who have been so instrumental. It has been such great work. And I, I should add that these campus folks have done this in the midst of an in virtual environment um, and COVID-19. So it's just been amazing work. Claire, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I told Claire you have a maximum of five minutes and I think she used all of them at least once, but, uh, but the work is, is, is vitally important. And, and, and listen, the, our ability to, to look at data and identify students at risk and then make real time decision support, use a tool for decision support in real time will make our efforts that much more efficacious. And, and, and there's a lot of people involved with that. I wanna thank Claire for her leadership. Mr. Chairman, we need to go to personnel uh, matters. And, uh, and there are some, there's some information I'd like to report on information matters that will require us to go into executive session. Yeah, so we, we have to um, uh, take a, um, to go into an executive session, we need to, uh, we need to, to um, do a, um, the board, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got thrown around with regard to the, uh, where we were, but, but in any event, the Board of Supervisors for the University of Louisiana se session, the, the Louisiana system, um, may meet in executive session to discuss personnel matters under provisions of Louisiana Revised Statute 4217. While in executive session, the board may, may not take any motions or take any votes. I have a motion and second to go into executive session. So oh, moved. Uh, Joe and, Salter. And who's second? Joe Salter moved then. Yes. And who's the second? Who's second? I'll second. Brad Stevens. Brad, Brad, Brad Stevens. All right, Carol, can you conduct a roll call vote? Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Brasada? Mr. Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Mr. Davison? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. It's, it's approved. Thank you. The board will now adjourn to executive session. Members, you need not do anything. Uh, Anne will move you into executive session herself, so you can just stay right where you are. I will have to move.
Okay. The Board of Supervisors for the University of Louisiana System met an executive session to discuss personnel matters. While in executive session, session, no motions were made, nor votes taken. Is there any motion to reconvene in open session? Can I get a motion? So moved. All right. We've got a motion in a second. 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 Thank Lower you. Down. Um. And so, uh, roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Busada? Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Mr. Davison? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Matheson? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Ms. Romero? Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Ms. Alter? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. It's approved. All right, so we're now back in open session from our from our um, from our session. So, let's. Uh, are there any other comments from the board at this time? Now that we're back in session from our executive session, if there are no comments, um, uh, Jim, you have something to say, Doctor uh, Mr. Carter. Uh, in addition. Board members, you were emailed copies of the personnel actions for review. These have been reviewed by the staff and they're recommended for approval. Uh, we need a motion and a second, Mr. Chairman. Do I have a motion? Move. Romero. Okay, Jeff. great. Pierre. Second by, by Pierre. Yes. All right. Moved by, by Romero, seconded by Pierre. Uh, may we have a roll call vote? Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Busada? Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Mr. Davidson? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Mr. Russ Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. It's passed. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as my report comes to a close, I want to acknowledge today that, that today is Charles Wentz's last day with us, last board meeting with us. Uh, he's done some extraordinary work with us in these last couple of years. Uh, his expertise will certainly be missed. His personality will be missed by some in the office, uh, but we wish him uh, the absolute, I, and I, I'm picking at him, that's what we do, but I'm, I'm wishing him the absolute best going forward. Charles, we thank you for your work and I know you're gonna be successful in your, in your future endeavors. Thank you very much, Dr. Henderson. And I just wanna say it's, it's kind of bittersweet leaving, but an opportunity presented itself and I uh, uh, felt almost obligated to take it or obligated to take it. But uh, I really enjoyed my time with the system and I'm gonna miss uh, the people I've worked with throughout, uh, not just at the system office or with the board, but also at the universities. Okay, and I wish you all the best and hopefully we can stay in touch and I can assist where I can assist. Well, thank you very much. You're always welcome back, but call first. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can make sure they're not going to be there when I get there. <laughs> hey, Charles, Charles Wentz, thank you so much for your service. You've been a delight and what part of the the upward mobility of the system. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Charles. I'll have to tell you this, that I remarked when I was in discussions uh, that I knew I had a reputation that preceded me. I just didn't know it was a good one. <laughs> You'll correct that in short order. Mr. Chair, but that concludes my report. All right, thank you. Board Chair's report, personnel financial disclosure statements. It's, it is time again to remind you that our annual financial disclosure statements for 2020 are due to the Board of Ethics by May 15th. If you need any assistance or have any questions, feel free to contact, contact Ms. Sandra Green. 
uh, annual training. As board members, we're required by the state to take ethics in, in preventing sexual harassment training annually. Bruce Janae will email information on how to access the required courses. Uh, commencements, just a reminder that Louisiana Tech has its winter commencement scheduled for March the 6th. Sandra has collected the various spring commencement dates and will email you a web page for you to RSVP to specific ceremonies. It means so much to the presidents, faculties, and graduates and their families to see our board members present at these various ceremonies. We encourage you to participate as your schedules allow and share in the accomplishments of our young people. National Guard resolution. We are always very aware of the challenges of each of our member institutions and what we have endured over the past 12 months. With challenge often comes assistance. This year we had benefited greatly from the brave men and women of the Louisiana National Guard. These soldiers have been an integral part of our response to COVID-19 and our recovery from devastating storms. From their COVID-19 testing operation on, on our operations on our campuses that not only served the university community, but the community at large, post-hurricane and post-winter storm recovery that provided basic need, needs to our people and offered helping hands in debris cleanup. I can't say enough about the partnership the Guard has provided the past 12 months. And as a gesture of gratitude, I would like to ask our board to offer resolution honoring the National Guard for their service. May I receive a motion? Um, how, how do you want to conduct this, Dr. Dr. Henderson, relative to how we frame this? I mean, we're asking the board is um, surely going to support a resolution. How would you like this conducted? We just need a, a motion that the, the board authorizes to issue a, a resolution honoring the Louisiana National Guard and of course, our communications team will, will package that in a, in a way that's very suitable for a meaningful presentation to the guard. Right, so I'm going to- I'll, I'll offer that motion, Chair Carter. Thank you, thank you so much. Do I have a second? Second. Second by- Methvin. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, Methvin, yeah. yes. Yeah, so yes, and then they're seconded. And so um, uh, vote, all those in favor, no opposed, right? All those in favor say aye. 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 No, no opposition, of course. Um, and so it's so passed. Our next meeting, our next regular meeting will be April the 22nd. Um, so we, let's keep that on our calendars and make sure that we, um, of course we participate and in, in let the, the broader public know that that's the date of our next meeting. If there's no other business. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Second. All right. Moved by Ms. Donahoe and second by who was that? Salter. Salter. Thank you. Second by Salter. Uh, that concludes our meeting. I'm sure we don't have any opposition. <laughs>